All right. Thanks everyone for coming. Um, yeah. You stuff. are, if you're here to talk and, or listen um, about the uh, Kubernetes Security Committee, you're in the right place. Um, I'm Micah Hausler. I'm a, a principal engineer at AWS. I uh, focus on Kubernetes security, EKS security. Um. Hi, all. I'm at Microsoft. I'm Mo. Uh, let's see. I guess I've been doing Kubernetes stuff since 2016 now and all sorts of security stuff. So thank you for coming. So before we, we start our talk, we'd, we'd say, um, we wanted to say, if you think you found an issue, um, stop <laughs> uh, before you, you tell somebody. Uh, the first place you need to go is the kubernetes.io uh, slash security. Uh, on that page, you'll see a bunch of helpful resources on what to do if you think you found one. Um, the, the short version for, for this talk is don't, please, please don't post anything that m you think is or might be a security issue on GitHub or um, Kubernetes Slack or message it to someone you think is on the security committee um, on Slack. Uh, usernames are, are, can be semi uh, faked. Um, yep. 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 So uh, please report to uh, our HackerOne bug bounty program um, or to our, just our inbox security at kubernetes.io. Go ahead. So what does the like SRC do? So we run the HackerOne bug bounty. So if you're a security researcher and that's how you make your living, uh, you know, we're happy to give you money if you come tell us where we screwed up. You know, we're more than happy to do that. Uh, but also like a large part of our work is just coordinating with the various code owners to get fixes out. So while we have a lot of expertise within the group, we don't know everything about Cube. So a lot of times we're spending a decent chunk of our effort just saying like, hey, SIG leads, is this an issue? Is this how it's supposed to work? Is this a, a doc fix? Like, what is this? How severe it is? Who does it impact? Those kind of things. Um, so we have a pretty broad, broad representation within the community. So like myself and Rita are from Microsoft. Micah and Balaji are from Amazon. Joel's from Red Hat. CJ's from Google. So. This diversity is really important to us because what might matter to Microsoft might not matter to Amazon, depending on how you deploy and run Kubernetes. But we want to make sure that when we do a severity rating, we're taking into account various deployment models within the community and just taking great care. We want to be on the side of caution, right? So like if we can think of like a subset of individuals where something that we might consider a medium is a high for them, so we want to take those types of things into account. So I'll talk a little bit about our, our bug bounty program. So this is uh, funded by the CNCF. Um, and uh, as far as scope, it's basically anything in the Kubernetes project. Um, you can go to our, our actual uh, HackerOne page and see the specifics on which projects are in scope. Um, but primarily, it's project code, project infrastructure. Um, the eligibility is uh, basically almost anyone, um, with exceptions for people on the security committee, CNCF staff. Um, if you're a project reviewer um, and or a maintainer, um, and you're you're reporting something that you maintain, you're not eligible for that. But if it's another part of the project that you're not don't work on or not familiar with, and you found something like that, that's that's great. Like, please report that to uh, please report it to us regardless. But you're you're eligible for a, a bounty. Um, we have several different tiers in our bug bounty. Um, tier one is the GA and beta features of core Kubernetes. Um, so think about when you if you spin up Kubernetes yourself um, or you're using a managed provider, sort of the 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 things in Kubernetes Kubernetes on GitHub. Um, so. Cube API server, Cube proxy, all those kind of things. Um, the core, core dependencies, so K-log, for an example, would be, would be included as well. Um, we also put in scope the ability to alter source code without owner approval. Like if you're able to bypass our you know, community processes and protections for the source code, that's, that's important to us. Um, or the ability to you know, modify release artifacts. Um, that, that affects our, our users. Um, same with release artifacts, like if you're able to you know, deny service to our, our container registry, that's, that's in scope. 
um, for this tier one. Um, not DDoS, so please don't drain the project of funds for hosting artifacts. Um, but that, that includes like registry.cates.io, um, dl.cates.io. And so our top tier, so critical, is, is $10,000 $10, US. Um, and we often, uh, if we find, uh, you know, even for lows um, and in our other tiers, we'll do bonuses and stuff too because we, we really appreciate when people um, report this and we, we want to incentivize people to, to find and report stuff. Yeah, like if you make it easy for us to reproduce and kind of show it to the SIGs, it makes our lives a lot easier. So yeah, we even if it's a low, we'll give out a bonus just for like, that was really nicely documented and saved us a bunch of time. Thank you. Yep, yep. Uh, yeah, and so for tier two, it's more uh, GA and beta features of non-core. So think of CSI drivers, Kubernetes dashboard, Kubeatom, that kind of thing. Um, and that's a little bit lower on the high end um, with criticals being 5,000 USD. Um, and then tier three being our infrastructure, like Prowl, um, documentation, Kubernetes.io, that kind of thing, um, uh, as well as alpha features in core. So if it's not enabled by default and it's a feature we want to get eventually, but you found something, we still want to reward that, um, but just it's not quite tier one. So you might be wondering if you're familiar with the various SIGs and pieces that make up the Kubernetes community, like how does like the product security committee or the security response committee, those are the product security committee is like the old name for security response committee, by the way. And sometimes we still mix them up in our heads. Like how does this relate to like SIG auth and um, SIG security, right? So if you're thinking about like code ownership and features and like how does like some in deep internal thing work? Like how does encryption at rest work in Kubernetes, right? That's SIG auth, right? So I'm gonna lead there. Um, so that's kind of what we do. But if you now think about what we spoke about with what SRC does, right? So we have fixed coordination and CVE issuance, and we have like core features of that are like security enforcing within the project. What about all the other aspects of security? Like, well, how do I run hardened Kubernetes? Um, and all those types of things. Um, that's where SIG security comes in. So they uh, help organize the Kubernetes security audit. Um, as well as things like the official CVE feed. Um, you know, they, they built a tooling around that. So, you know, if there's a Venn diagram, there's almost certainly an intersection between these three groups, but that's kind of like the high level thing, right? But again, remember, if you think it's a security issue, come to SRC first and we'll, we'll help you find the right place. Yeah, so uh, to talk through our process a little bit, um, we, we do get a hand, you know, a, a steady stream of issues reported to us. Um, they, they come in sort of through the, through the two front doors of HackerOne and, and, our, and our email list. Um, the kind of first thing we do is just a preliminary assessment. Um, a lot of us on the security committee have a background in Kubernetes, um, multiple years involved in the project and sort of different areas. Um, and so we can have generally enough context to say, is this, is this a legitimate issue or not? And if it's not, we can help close it, you know, redirect the, the reporter to the right place if it's um, still an issue that needs to be resolved but not a security issue, um, or if it's just actually not an issue or not something that we care about, um, uh, like uh, text records and for, for email domain validation or something like that. Um, uh, if it is an issue that we, we can either say is an issue or we need more help, we'll typically work with the code owners of the affected component. Um, sometimes this is, it's not clear who that is. It's, usually it, it is. Um, and they often have a lot more context and can help say, is this an issue or not? Um, when it is, we the next step is really for us to issue a CVE. So Kubernetes is a CNA, a CVE naming authority, I think, um, that can, or numbering authority, that can um, issue, we, we can issue CVEs for, for security issues. Um, and at that point, we have an identifier that we can hold on to and say, this represents this issue. We can refer to that um, uh, before it's public. Um, and the, the next sort of decision point for us really is, does this affect core Kubernetes? Um, not just from the bug bounty tier one perspective, but really from just a mechanic perspective of, uh, do we need to work with the release team? Because when you do a Kubernetes release, you can't just put a code fix in uh, in main or master and 
call it done. Um, there's a release process. You want to get that out to users and everything. So uh, we work with, if it's in core Kubernetes, we work with the release team to make sure that that gets into the main branch and then back to possible uh, maintained release branches um, so that we have cherry picks in for, for all those. Um, if it's not in core cube, we still work with typically the code owners. Um, if it's Nginx Ingress or any other sort of sub project under Kubernetes. Um, and then the next decision is kind of the same on either Kubernetes core or non-core, and that's does it affect distributors? So is this something that distributors might care about and needs to be handled with more care? Um, the kind of rough estimate we use, and we have this codified in our, um, in our public GitHub repo, is uh, generally around a medium, if it's a high, more, more high or critical or some kind of medium, um, we might uh, do a coordinated uh, disclosure and embargo process with distributors. So distributors are those who um, kind of think major clouds or vendors who sell Kubernetes, um, or sell and manage Kubernetes or Kubernetes artifacts, that kind of thing. Um, so yeah, like I said, major clouds, canonical, Red Hat, like th those kind of folks. Um, and they get a distributor notification to say, here's an issue. Um, it might affect you and your users. You have X amount of time before this goes public to um, uh, to resolve this, whether that's in a managed environment, you know, fixing it for your users, or if you're not in a managed environment, um, pack, you know, test these changes before they, they're either the changes are public or they're released, and uh, test that it won't won't affect your users. Um, and if it doesn't affect distributors, generally that's kind of a low issue, um, or um, or it could be a high issue. We'll talk about later. Um, that just doesn't affect distributors. Uh, we'll we'll work with code owners and then do a public disclosure. Um, and that public disclosure process generally involves a GitHub post, GitHub issue for the tracking the issue. Um, uh, an email list blast to several different diff different email lists, as well as publishing the CVE de uh, details to uh, MITRE so that all the, the public CVE feeds that you, you follow and uh, have the actual specific details, in including versions affected and um, all the classification of the issue. So, so we'll talk about a few of those. So let's see, I, I think this bug, uh, which was reported through the last security audit for Kubernetes is possibly one of my most favorite bugs in like a really long time because it's like super easy to explain and think about. And I think I've been reading this same code since like 2016 and I've never seen it. So, you know, it happens. Um, so let's walk through this. So let's say you're a bad client and you try to make a get request saying, hey, I want to get all the pods in the dot dot namespace and anyone who's ever done anything with paths and like Linux already knows where this is going. Uh, but if you're not familiar, the way sort of the path routing works, right, is after the namespaces part, that little block is like the name of the namespace you want. And then right after that is the resource that you want, right? So conceptually, the API server will take this request and try to authorize it against, hey, can the current user list all pods in the dot dot namespace? which by the way is not a valid namespace identifier. So that means there's no way to like grant this via like a role binding, but you might have cluster wide read. So if you have the ability to list all pods in the cluster, it'll go through. And then we have to turn this into the correct etcd query to figure out how to give you your data back. Well, if you're familiar with how kubectl works, right? You can ask for resources that are namespace scoped but cluster wide, right? So you can say, hey, show me all the pods in the cluster. The way that's efficiently implemented in the back end is the resource comes first and then the namespace. So that way you can list all of a resource without first enumerating all the namespaces. So the etcd key ends up being pod slash dot dot. So it's reversed from the rest logic. And then, you know, because we like producing bugs, uh, we have a path prefix on this to like have like the the I think the reason the path prefix exists is because technically you can use one etcd from many different Kubernetes instances if you so want. So you have to have a way of like bucketizing this. Um, so we like to use the fun bug creating 
Go function called path.join, where if you pass it anything with dot dots in it, it helpfully cleans it up for you because that's what you asked. And so it turns into slash registry, which is a fun way of saying, hey, Kubernetes, please dump out etcd for me. Uh, so as you can tell, that's not what list of all pods means, but that's what happens. Um, yeah, so, so how did this go for us? Well, uh, it didn't go too badly, and you might be asking, well, why? Uh, it's called really good dumb luck. Um, so for nothing related to security, the API server code has a lot of like type safe logic. And by type, I mean like Kubernetes resource here. So if you tried to do that last command on like an old API server, it would basically be like, I don't know how to turn a secret into a pod, and it'll fail the request. But custom resources don't have static types because we don't know any static type to represent them. So in a certain set of use cases, you can get the API server to give you access to resources from that are custom resources that you don't have read access to. So this was bad. Uh, and we got lucky, but obviously we don't ever want this to happen again. So what did we do? Uh, so we started checking for dots very explicitly at the lower levels of our code just to make sure that those are not valid in any sense of the word, so we just don't let you have that, no matter how you make it through the millions of lines of Go code above those layers. Uh, if you somehow get to us and you have the empty string or just the slash, that's also not valid because that should never happen. And then we just stop using path.join. We just, we just use good old string concat, and yeah, no more bugs there. So the other issue uh, we wanted to talk about is uh, that with Minikube. This came out last week. Um, so you may not have even seen this notice yet. Um, it's actually a combination of two different issues. Um, one affects only Minikube on Mac OS. Um, and that first one is a uh, Mac OS bug where if you tried to, the, the VM, so, mini, so backing up, Minikube is a development environment um, of Kubernetes. So you can install it on your Windows, uh, I think Linux and, uh, and Mac OS to say I want to have a mini Kubernetes cluster that I can play around with for development. Um, so uh, the first bug uh, resulted in specifying localhost as a listen address for the Kubernetes VM, but it ended up listening on all uh, interfaces on the, the host and forwarding all uh, any forwarded ports on all interfaces to the, uh, to, to the VM. Uh, so that's, that, that in itself is like not great, but not necessarily awful or catastrophic. Um, the, the, the real issue here um, came with the combination of this other CVE, where in the Minikube VM, so if you install Minikube however you do, um, the VM image had a hard-coded root password and had SSH turned on and had root login enabled for SSH. So that means anyone running an affected version of Minikube had a hard-coded open SSH password on the local network um, and uh, that could be accessed remotely. So remote code execution to the, to the VM and in some cases, depending on the driver, I think sometimes the home directory was also mounted into the VM, which is particularly bad. So this was actually uh, one, an example of a critical vulnerability that we handled, um, but we didn't have to do an embargo for. Because <laughs> um, we can't. Yeah, this, because we this, can't. There's no way to do an embargo. For this. Yeah, yeah. This was 9.9. .9. Yeah, this was a yeah, this was a 9.9. A so this was probably I think one of if maybe the wor the worst one I've handled um, in my my few years on the, the security committee. Um, you can look all the at the all the gory details of it in our uh, public announcement and on the the mini cube GitHub issue. Um, so just key takeaways from this are uh, you kind of have heard what we do, what the, what the security committee does, um, and how kind of how we handle our, our issues. And, and if you do find an issue, please report it. Um, we really want to work with you, uh, but uh, please do it responsibly through HackerOne or our, our email list. Um, but that's, that's all the slides we have for today, but we're happy to do Q&A for anyone who has questions. Yeah, so if you report something through HackerOne that makes it eligible for the bug bounty, Though, if you don't want to make a HackerOne account, if you did report something through the mailing list that we would issue a bounty for, we would just ask you after the fact, just go submit it to HackerOne. Like, we can't give you money, but HackerOne can give you money on behalf of us. So that's kind of how that works out. Yeah.
Yeah. Any questions? Uh, let's see. Do we get? I'll, I'll walk around. What about architectural flaws? For example, I had discussions with developers about the service account token before Kubernetes 1.24, which is definitely an architectural flaw importing this kind of token into every pod. And, and the developers needed it, and I, after a while, simply said, okay, this is a hack here on GitHub for my trainings. You can use it get access to the entire cluster. And then I get a call from a vendor and then I don't know if I was really responsible for that. In the next version, the service account token was not the default. And then on Microsoft AKS, it's 1.23 now. It's not fixed there in the default disk. So how, how do we handle this kind of, of, of things? There's a, yeah, I'll, I'll, I can take this one. Uh, there's a lot of ambiguity in all this. So the flow chart that we showed is like a very, I would say a very rough approximation. Um, just a lot of these are one-off questions that we have to sort of figure out the process for. Um, I think, uh, I don't know Mo, if you want to add, add on to this. I, I, yeah, I mean that, that, that diagram is like the special happy, happy path, right? Like where, where, where there's no like, hmm. No, I'm so sure about this one, right? Like, yeah, um, the, I think just to answer your specific question about like architectural flaws, I, I think those are definitely things that um, we want to know about. Um, but oftentimes, like the specific one you mentioned, I think is like a, kind of a well-known one where the code owners generally know. If you do find something and you do think it's a security issue, please report it. Like we'll help you. It, it's okay to find, to, to for us to say, no, it's not. And here's the right person to talk to and the right SIG lead to say, okay, here's a thing we, and, and oftentimes the SIG lead, lead, leads will already know and say, yeah, we want to fix that and we have a plan for that or something. But I think I, I would probably say generally report it rather than uh, not. Yeah, so at, like as a lead for SIG auth and like, you know, a component owner for stuff like service accounts and stuff, right? It's like, we have to be very careful with these things now because we have actual users and we can't just go like ripping stuff out, even stuff like legacy service account tokens, which we know is a bad idea. And we've known it was a bad idea for like years now, um, but we're kind of stuck, right? But that doesn't mean that we can't write caps to like, like give people the tools to like, hey, yeah, by default, you still get this bad behavior because we can't like break people and upgrade. But you know, here's a new knob that makes it safer, or here's a new style that we're migrating. Like with the service account token stuff, I think we started rolling out the fixes in like, I don't know, like 116. And it's like, we, we were just going like a very slow path because we know it's so critical to pods and we don't want to break people's stuff. But at the same time, we want newer clusters as well as like upgraded clusters to get eventually to a safe space. Um, but yeah, so like certainly, you know, report it to us. Even if it ends up just being like a doc fix or a blog post to just highlight the issue, that's that's fine. Like, like we're not gonna get upset if people like give us too many issues because like I mean we have the hacker one triage folks helping us too, so it's not just us. Any other questions? Uh, thank you for Mike. Do you have uh, some of our best practices for how to do security in Kubernetes cluster? You wanna take it? Okay, take it. Yeah, I, that, I think there are there are a lot of best practice guides out there. Um, I think that that specifically would sort of fall under SIG security as best practices, how to how to run Kubernetes securely. They they are often the folks who also work with like the, the people who write the CIS benchmark. Um, that kind of thing. So we're we're sort of like we know them and we work with them, you know, uh, tangentially a lot of the time and and or even closely sometimes. Um, but th that's probably the best venue for those kind of uh, guides because they, they're the people who own that and uh, and and write them. We'll often work with them and say, here's oh here's a thing. It might be a report. It might be something else. Um, or a report and then we start digging and be like, okay, that, that's a valid report. Here's like three other things that are affected um, that either need a fix or need doc updates. Um, but SIG security would be the main owners of that. Yeah, and T Tabitha, a member of the SRC is also one of the leads for SIG security, just like I'm a lead for SIG odd. So like 
we have a lot of like cross membership, so we'll find you the right people. The question was, um, do we want to talk talk about older? Sorry, I'm, I'm bouncing around on you. Um, talk about older Kubernetes versions. So, uh, we, part of our bug bounty program and disclosure program is uh, we scope what versions that we take reports for. Um, generally, that's just currently maintained versions. Kubernetes has about a one year uh, one year period of uh, maintenance on on minor releases, and so those those are the ones that we accept and award for the bug bounty program uh, monetary awards for. Um, we don't make awards for unmaintained end of life versions, um, but there, there can still be security issues in them. Um, and that necessarily might not affect newer maintained versions. Um, in those cases, uh, we'd still ask, I think that you report the issue, um, even if it's not eligible for bounty, because uh, there are, it's a known thing that there are a lot of distributors who also distribute versions beyond the upstream end of life to some longer period. And we'd want to work with uh, the community and with our distributor community to notify them to say, you know, this is not something we're going to patch or maintain or anything, but you all are owning Kubernetes for your customers. And we want to help you out and say, here's an issue. You might want to know about it. You get to, you get to go figure this out. Um, but yeah. This is maybe a bit more vendor related, but I wonder, so we are running clusters with um, Glue and Nginx. And I wonder if there is a security vulnerability in one of those uh, yeah, frameworks libraries, is there a central place to go to, to find if something is going on? Or is this, should I go to each vendor or is there a central location? I, I think I can take that. Um, I think it's it's really going to be each vendor. Um, like if you're if you're paying a vendor for if you're paying a five or whoever for Nginx, um, yeah, work with them. If you're using an open source project like Nginx Ingress, that's a Kubernetes owned thing. You'd report that to the the Kubernetes security committee. Um, for anything else, it'd sort of be its own respective either vendor if you're using you know a vendor paid solution or to the respective open source project. So things we don't take reports for, even though they're commonly used with Kubernetes are like core DNS, etcd, um, Prometheus, like Otel, all those kinds of things have their own process and their own people who maintain those projects and handle those reports. Um, so we, or container D being another one, right? It's used, everyone, almost everyone uses that or cryo with Kubernetes and they have their own security process. So we, we Sometimes, you know, coordinate with them if it's a, sometimes there's weird coordination bugs where it's like Kubernetes and cryo specific or Kubernetes and container D or something. Um, but generally we, if it's a specific, if, if you think it's Kubernetes, please tell us. And if we find that it is container D, we also know those people and can, can forward it to them. But if it's, if you know, okay, it's with this specific project, you'd follow up with either a project or a vendor. Yeah, and like maybe to add to that, like just like, like what we do like internally sometimes is like we'll have like our own mailing list that has like our security like you know like our own security folks and then we'll subscribe that mailing list to all the vendors that we interact with so that way we have like one place when we see an email notification it's going to our security folks so then we can figure out oh i see a container d had an issue all right i'm going to go find our container d person and be like what do we do does this does this impact aks yes or no uh, do we have to notify customers or is it something that we can do on the back end and all that stuff, right? But yeah, we, just as, you know, like Micah and myself are in SRC, we're also on the other end and in our employers, right? We, we sort of handle the inputs. Yeah. Any other questions? So the HackerOne bug bounty has been active for about three years. It looks like maybe $50,000 has been given out, which is pretty cool. But across three years, that maybe feels kind of small, only a couple. With having done security audits now on the project, do you feel like the project is getting a, enough attention? Both on, on that kind of generating issue sides and then also on the response side, how are you all doing on sustainability within the SRC? 
start? I'll, I'll start, yeah. I think um, we, we do get a steady stream of reports. A lot of them are, um, so to the point of architectural weaknesses, sometimes it's not architectural weakness. Like there was recently a, a I don't know this, that this came through a report to us, but it went through, I know it went through to our, uh, us and a bunch of other vendors on um, uh, very powerful pods in a cluster. That like if you have a powerful daemon set that you can privilege escalate to other nodes and that's not like a necessarily a Kubernetes vulnerability, but it's a pattern that uh, can be done that can that ha that is that or that at the time was was copied and uh, used a lot. That was an insecure pattern. Um, but to your question about uh, engagement, I, I think we do get a pretty good engagement. Like we we do get some reports. A lot of them are just lows, um, and I think I, I I don't know that I would say that Kubernetes can't have a. I, I know Kuber, I would not say Kubernetes can't have a critical issue. I definitely think it could. Um, I think it's just we we between our our security audits between more people looking at the code, um, we found some more th some more of these issues, um, but we just haven't seen the the higher end um, more of the higher end ones come through. A lot of them are like on the lower end to where um, it's a single node DOS or something like that. Yeah, and I think it's also just a matter of like complexity. Like I think the amount of effort and knowledge and skill set that you would need to find a critical in Cube is kind of high, and I mean, I'll ignore nation state actors that won't, they won't report it to us, they'll just use it. Um, so like, I, I think it is some of that, like, uh, like we, like we definitely want to encourage people to look for those and try to find them and report them to us, but it's, it hasn't really happened. Um, I think on the second part of your question, Tim, on like sustainability. So I've been thinking about this a lot recently just because like, you know, that's not a lot of people. It, on that list, right? So like, I think like two high level plans I have, and this is just like in my head, not really like formally that well discussed, but I'll say it here, is so like we're thinking about like, should we have like some folks who have a different role within the committee, like a more like a product manager role? Because we don't have like explicit deadlines, we don't have like releases and like just things to kind of keep things moving. So it's very easy for us to like, get consumed with like our downstream or even other upstream commitments. So like, like I personally struggle with like dealing with all the paperwork involved with like a bug. Like if, if there's like an interesting bug, I will go fix it in like a day, but then it'll take me like three weeks before I can like write the doc on it. Cause I just don't like doing that. But you know, it's human issues there. The other aspect is like that list of like eight or so people, like we are all like relatively senior and later in our careers. What that also means is we have a lot of responsibilities already. So I've, I've been hoping to come up with some plan to like have more junior folks join that obviously will have more to learn, but they'll also have more time and energy to kind of put forth in things. Like uh, um, when we had, uh, I think uh, I'm blanking on the name, like the yearly SIG health thing. What, what is it called? The annual report, right? So like the annual report was asked of us recently. I was like, I don't think we have anything to put in this, and that doesn't sound like a good sign, um, right? Like, there's like one thing I would like to have is like better like tooling and process around like private releases and stuff. Like, like if it's something was critical, like how would we like maybe like issue like not like a private image, but like an image that has non-open source code in it to our community, because you know we like we can do this for distributors, but we could buy just handing them the patch and letting them do it. Right, but if it was critical, critical, we would we would want to protect the community better too. So, one minute. Anybody have a last question? Short question. I think we'll call it. Thank you, everyone. Thank you for coming.